Hello there, discerning citizen. Do you want to buy some illegal boons? Or perhaps you'd prefer something for your enemies, some debilitating conditions perhaps? Boons and conditions are vital parts of battling in Guild Wars 2, and by the end of this video you'll know what they all do, how to use them, and what they look like. Before we get into it, you might be thinking, wow, this is a long video. And you would be right. However, there are 26 total boons and conditions to get through, and that encompasses the majority of types of special effect in the entire game, so it's an action-packed ride. Be sure to use the timestamps below and in the video progress bar to skip around the topics that you want to learn about. With that out of the way, let's start with a few general facts that apply to both of these vital mechanics. There are two types of boons and conditions, those that stack in intensity and those that stack in duration. Applying multiple instances of boons or conditions that stack in duration will put them in a queue of sorts where they patiently wait for each other to run out before taking over. When applying multiple copies of a boon or condition that stacks in intensity, the effect will stack up on top of itself, magnifying the effect up to 25 times, and essentially running in parallel, such that some stacks of a boon you might have might be shorter than others and run out at different times. This means that maintaining stacking boons or conditions on a target requires using them in a slightly more coordinated fashion. If they all get spammed at the same time, you might end up overcapping or wasting stacks, and then afterwards, your hard-earned effects will all run out at the same time, leaving you without access to them when you need them the most. A lot of boons and conditions also have a visual effect associated with them. You can use this to your advantage to make snap decisions, however, some of the indications are not really visible during all the effect explosions of combat, so you can always see exactly what effects are on you, your allies or your target, by looking just underneath their portraits, or in your case, the status bar. This can take some getting used to, but it's quite important for player versus player, as you'll want to take boons and conditions into account before acting. Boons and conditions can also be manipulated by both allies and enemies. Conditions can be cleansed, removing them instantly, or, even better, converted into the corresponding boon. And the opposite is also true. Boons can be stripped away from adversaries, or rather insidiously corrupted into their mostly logical condition counterparts. These removal and conversion effects are particularly devastating because they don't care how long the boon or condition was, or how many stacks you had. They will get of all of them in one fell swoop. More rarely, some abilities steal boons or transfer conditions to enemies, turning strength into a fatal downfall. Another little detail about boon and condition removal is the concept of covering. The idea is that if you overload your enemy with conditions, then when they try to remove them, they'll remove conditions that you don't particularly care about them removing, leaving the really deadly or inconvenient ones left hanging around. This is because although cleansing does remove conditions instantly, you don't get to choose which ones are removed all the time. The most recently applied conditions will always be removed first, meaning a bunch of junk conditions can throw themselves in front of a deadly 25 burning stack. Certain abilities do specifically target a certain condition or boon, but this is somewhat uncommon. The same is true for boons. It'll be harder for your opponents to remove a specifically powerful boon if you're covered in the things. There are some exceptions to this too. Some abilities have a specific priority for boon removal, but you can't hurt your chances by stacking up. Boon control and condition management using all of these mechanics is truly essential, and I think that most players don't realize just how strong these effects really are. The good news is, after this video, you will be one of the elite few. It is now time to learn exactly what all 12 unique boons do. Let's get to it. First and foremost is Aegis. Aegis causes the next attack to target you to be blocked and stacks in duration. When an attack is blocked, the Aegis will immediately end. This is a subtly powerful effect. Consider that if you have an Aegis when a massive 10,000 damage critical strike is incoming, it will be completely mitigated. This also goes for any conditions that the attack might apply. Of course, you might end up blocking a very weak attack as well, but that is where a lot of the play in this boon is found. Careful timing can make Aegis a very powerful effect to block a deadly boss attack or be incredibly annoying in PvP against professions that utilize powerful single-hit attacks. 
Watch out though, Aegis can't block everything, and some attacks are in fact unblockable. Even Aegis can't save you from those. Aegis also has a fairly distinctive visual effect. It manifests as a shield on a character's left arm. Up next is Alacrity, which is a simple cooldown reduction effect. It's worded in-game as skills recharging 25% faster, which equates to a 20% cooldown reduction with permanent Alacrity. This also applies to traits that cast skills, but not to traits that simply have an internal cooldown, but don't cast a skill. That might sound a bit complicated, but it's easy to tell the difference by just looking at trait tooltips. Alacrity stacks in duration, and players empowered by Alacrity also have a fizzling smoke effect around their body with flashes of colour. Your skill cooldown numbers will also turn a pleasing shade of green. Alacrity is a very powerful boon. Not only does it mean you can attack your opponents with your lethal abilities more often, it also recharges all of your healing, buffing, evasion, utility, and profession mechanics faster, pretty much making you better in every way. It's one of the truly indispensable player versus environment boons, and if you don't have it permanently while raiding, something is going wrong. It's much less common in competitive game modes and is only available to a few professions, but if you can grab some, it can certainly turn the tide of a tough battle. Cooldown management is incredibly important in every aspect of the game, and Alacrity makes it just that little bit easier. Fury is a change of pace from the previous two and is a simple boon that increases your critical strike chance by 20%, stacking in duration. At this point, you're probably noticing a bit of a theme here. These boons are very, very strong indeed. 20% critical strike chance is 420 precision. Nice. For reference, an entire set of Ascended Berserker armor and a Berserker amulet grants 423 precision just three more than Fury on its own. This boon is a massive increase to your damage output for any power build. It's also quite handy for condition damage builds too, as many have traits that apply additional conditions on landing a critical strike. Fury is absolutely key for any build trying to deal out power damage, as it will greatly increase the consistency of your damage output. Bear in mind, all your extra critical strike damage from Ferocity is completely worthless unless you actually connect a critical strike. Fury has no visual effect. How about that? Now, Might is a real boon. Stacking in intensity up to 25 times, Might grants 30 power and 30 condition damage per stack, which is up to 750 of both. Given that an aggressive build might have around 2,600 power or 1,500 condition damage, you can see how pound for pound, Might is pretty much the strongest boon when stacked all the way up. If you've got 25 might, your enemies had better watch out. You'll want this all the time when fighting monsters in the environment. Maintaining might can be a bit more challenging in competitive modes, but well, if you can, you're only a Sony Vegas free trial away from a montage, particularly because might ends up being more impactful in player versus player as base attributes are a fair bit lower there. Upon gaining might, orange and red lightning will crackle around your player's hands quite appropriate, I think. Players tend to often forsake the next boon, but they are fools to do so, because protection is an absurdly strong one, reducing all incoming damage by 33%. This stacks in duration, but can be combined with other damage reduction effects too, for incredible durability. Bear in mind that protection won't help you versus condition damage. There is a boon for that though, which we'll get to later. Having protection before charging into battle is something you definitely want to do, and never underestimate just how good this effect really is. Less damage taken means less healing needed to survive, and also allows you to stay in the fray for longer and deal out punishment. Protected players have blue swirls around them, and when they first gain the boon, a shield appears temporarily on their torso. Prepare yourself for a boon so good that many raiders consider the game unplayable without it. Quickness. 
Quickness increases the rate your character performs skills by 50%. As you can imagine, this is very good. Damage output with quickness goes up significantly, but so is healing and support. Quickness allows the player to chain together deadly combos much faster, or layer down masses of healing and boons when they are needed the most. Quickness can be quite rare, particularly in competitive game modes, and when you have it, your enemies will quake in fear, as they'll have a much harder time reacting to your abilities. As I mentioned earlier, when playing a player versus environment challenge, like a raid, quickness is not optional. Some would rather uninstall than play without the speed, and it's certainly true that once you get used to playing with permanent quickness, it can be very hard to go back to the slug tier gameplay. Quickness stacks in duration, but it is worth noting only up to five times, so you'll want to be careful about spamming it too hard. Bestowing quickness temporarily blurs the lucky recipient. Don't worry about that visual effect though, you'll definitely notice it when you're getting beaten down by a reaper swinging a massive scythe at unfeasible speeds. Not all boons are as flashy as quickness, but that does not mean you can underestimate them. Regeneration is a simple boon. When applied, a soothing blue mist appears around the target and restores health every second. You may not even notice regeneration sometimes, but it is incredibly powerful over a long period of time. Particularly if you're in a situation where there is some pulsing damage constantly damaging you, or if you get a temporary reprieve from damage, your health bar will simply creep back up over time. Regeneration stacks in duration and has a special mechanic because it scales with healing power. To make sure that healers are getting bang for their boon, the most powerful regeneration stack will always take priority over inferior ones. And a good thing too, regeneration is quite common, so without this, powerful stacks would constantly be getting overpowered by pleb baseline regeneration, which sits at just 130 health per second. Regeneration is also affected by healing modifiers, so wherever you see increases healing by some percentage, that will also apply to your regeneration. This can get absolutely insane, and in some extreme cases, regeneration can be healing for upwards of 500 per second, which can often lead to regeneration alone keeping your allies sustained. Protection might not save you from conditions, but resistance certainly will. While you have resistance, light blue cubes joined by beams of light float around your torso, and all conditions damaging or debilitating will be completely nullified. Bear in mind that this doesn't remove the conditions, just makes you temporarily immune. For example, if you have a very long dose of immobilization, resistance will let you move again, but after the resistance wears off, you will once again be latched onto the ground. This even applies to fear for quite amusing results. Resistance will fill your character with courage, but if the fear hasn't worn off before this resistance ends, then when that happens, your character will get back to advancing in reverse. Resistance is an incredibly powerful boon, and it's quite rare, so use it carefully because you won't have it all the time, and enemies might try and remove it or steal it with a high priority. Resistance corrupts into chill too, which is just fantastically painful. Watch out for it on your enemies as well, as it can let them ignore your attacks and press the assault for a time. Just bear in mind that you can still have conditions applied to you while booned up, and you can still apply conditions to enemies with resistance, meaning you can stack them up for a nasty surprise after it runs out. For the porcupine enthusiasts amongst you, retaliation is the way to go. Retaliation causes you to instantly deal damage back for every single time an enemy hits you. Retaliation stacks in duration and actually scales a bit with your power attribute, meaning the more power you have, the more damage you'll deal back. Because of this, retaliation is very good at dealing damage back to enemies who do a lot of small attacks, but is less effective against single massive strikes, because the retaliation dealt back is only based on the base value plus a fraction of your power, not on how hard you got hit. Retaliation also doesn't really do much versus monsters, it's more of a player versus player thing. This is because monsters typically hit quite hard, so you really don't want getting hit to be a part of your plan. You also just do massive damage on your own anyway, so there's no point in risking it. In player versus player and world versus world, you might be able to ignore retaliation if you're getting babysat by a support player, but if you don't have a lot of sustain yourself, you might get ground down significantly by retaliation, so watch out for that fist. In addition to its boon icon, retaliation is marked by a crystal wing-like shield on a character's left arm. 
If you've been playing Guild Wars 2 for a while, you probably got stunned, dazed, fell over, or just blown away, and it probably didn't feel that good. But I have excellent news. Stability is here to save the day. Stability stacks in intensity, and every stack will absorb one crowd control effect. Control effects are one of the main methods that players will use to lock you down and kill you, and it's not uncommon for monsters to do the same. So having stability will not only save you from aggression, it will also allow you to ignore your opponent's attempts to stop you from demolishing them. Because stability does not stack in duration, be very careful when using a stability granting ability. If you overlap applications, then you might end up wasting some and then finding yourself in a sticky situation. Stability is important in every game mode, and often gets overlooked in player versus environment, but it can actually trivialize certain boss encounters. It's only in world versus world where its true power is demonstrated. In fact, the standard playstyle for world versus world simply does not work without high stability uptime. In player versus player, there can be at maximum five players trying to stunlock you. In world versus world, it's entirely possible you'll be facing 50. You can see why you might need stability to deal with that. It can turn you from a pinball getting battered to an unstoppable juggernaut of destruction. Embrace the glory of stability and use it as your window of opportunity to crush your opponents. Despite its awesome power, stability has no visual indicator. When facing stable foes, don't waste your crowd control when there are stacks remaining. If you're with allies, you might be able to break through the immovable pedestals by spamming crowd control, but a lot of the time you'll either need to remove the stability or wait for it to expire to avoid wasting your valuable disabling skills. Stability also happens to be one of the most brutal corruptions, as it transforms into fear, causing a once indomitable player to run away screaming. Stability might give you some security, but players will often notice it and try and erase it, or worse. The next two boons are some of the most underrated, so it's appropriate they come last, but they are both like being able to breathe through your nose. Normally taken for granted, but when you lose that ability when afflicted by the plague, you realize just how much you relied on that ability. The first of the pair is swiftness. It's very straightforward. Swiftness makes you run 33% faster. Incredible. That might not seem like a big deal, but being able to get away from enemies in player versus player, rush your opponents in world versus world at breakneck speed, dash out of a death zone created by a fearsome boss, or just running around the map faster is absolutely game-changing, and playing without swiftness or some kind of movement speed increase makes you feel like an absolute snail. As mentioned in the combat system guide, movement is imperative in every single aspect of Guild Wars 2, and mastering it is key to mastering the combat system, and swiftness just makes that much, much easier. This is particularly true in player versus player, where kiting your enemies and moving around the map to contest objectives is the name of the game. Swiftness stacks in duration, and is pretty common, so most professions have the ability to give a good amount of it, either to themselves or to allies, making it relatively easy to maintain, but no less important. To demonstrate its power, swiftness gives your character's feet trails of pure speed when running around. Finally in the boon zone is Vigor. The elusive leaf grants 50% endurance regeneration, meaning you can dodge every 6.6 .6 seconds instead of every 10 seconds. Dodging is the most important tool you can have in your arsenal of survival. Having access to that significantly more is absolutely amazing. Almost invulnerability frames are always good, and having Vigor at the right time can nudge your endurance up to the point of a daring acrobatic escape. I call Vigor the elusive leaf because it's not the most common boon, and for good reason. Few professions are capable of applying it in large quantities, and even in a raid environment, teams might have to work together to guarantee high uptime. Nevertheless, Vigor is always a welcome addition to the status bar. Vigor stacks in duration, because if it stacked in intensity, that would just be an infinite dodge hack. That's all of the boons covered. Aren't they wonderful? But there is one thing better than boons, and that is, of course, using conditions to make your opponents useless and eventually rage quit. Let's talk about those. 
Conditions come in a few flavors. Damaging conditions, which deal damage over time. Punishment conditions, which deal damage which intensifies or has an additional effect when the target does something. And control conditions, which don't do damage, but are often very, very annoying. Vulnerability is a special snowflake and doesn't really fit in, and is a simple, pure debuff. Damaging conditions and vulnerability stack in intensity, and control conditions stack in duration. I can't imagine the horror of what would happen if control conditions stacked in intensity. Anyway, first up are bleeding and burning. I'm grouping these two because they are very similar. They both deal damage every second. Burning does more damage per stack, as being on fire is worse than a paper cut, but make no mistake, bleeding can absolutely obliterate your opponents, as it can often be applied in huge amounts for longer durations than burning. This can often lead to burning being a more bursty condition compared to the slow erosion of bleeding. Not much else to say about these two, really. They are basic damage over time effects, and burning actually sets you on fire for extra roleplay. Conditions were so popular in Guild Wars 2 that the developers decided to add a new one a bit after the release of the game. Its name was Torment. Similar to Bleeding and Burning, it does damage every second per stack, but with a twist. The damage is doubled if the unfortunate victim decides to move. We talked earlier about how important movement is in Guild Wars 2, so it should come as no surprise that this puts your enemies in quite the conundrum. Avoid movement and risk getting demolished by more attacks, or run away but take significantly more damage. To indicate this horror, red lines attack the player's ankles. Now, it's important to be clear that stopping moving is not always an option. It is sometimes, even in player versus player, but a lot of the time you're just going to have to minimize shuffling and not jiggle about to mitigate the damage. Torment is particularly powerful, of course, in player versus player for that reason, but there are plenty of monsters that like to run about a bit, and even certain bosses are susceptible to moving around too much for their own good. In a similar vein to Torment is Confusion. Confusion manifests as a purple haze around a character's head and does minor damage every second per stack. But if you dare to use any skill, including auto attacks and profession mechanics, then for each stack of Confusion, you punch yourself in the face and hurt yourself in your Confusion. It can be extremely funny to watch fast attacking bosses obliterate themselves on Confusion, but when you're the one poking yourself in the eye while swinging your sword, it's quite brutal. You might think there is not much you can really do to counter this, but there are a few things to do, or rather, not do. First of all, just wait until the confusion is gone. Moving and dodging are all good with confusion, and confusion is often fairly short in duration. The second is remove the confusion. Using a skill that has condition cleanse attached to it that then removes the confusion will not activate the confusion damage, breaking you out with no punishment. Confusion has no cooldown on its active effect, so be very careful when afflicted with it. You can very quickly kill yourself if you're not careful and start spamming abilities in panic. A side effect of Confusion is that it can also be used as a great defensive tool. If you apply a massive amount of Confusion and your opponent doesn't have any cleanse, then they might be forced to do nothing for a few seconds, almost functioning as a daze effect, allowing you to fully unleash your assault with little fear for reprisals. Finally, for the punishing conditions, we have Poison. In traditional RPG fashion, Poison turns characters a sickly shade of green and deals damage per stack, just like Bleeding or Burning, but with the very nasty added effect of reducing all incoming healing by 33%. Most monsters don't do much in the way of healing, but players absolutely do, making this vital in all competitive modes, and a real pain when monsters apply it to you. A way to think about why poison is so strong is to imagine that every time a player gets healed for 3,000, they take 1,000 damage, which is quite devastating. Additionally, poison slows revival speed too, so when looking to prevent enemy players from reviving their allies, poison can really shut that down and allow you to finish the job. Obviously, you might want to avoid wasting healing when poisoned, but just like Torment, sometimes you can't play around this. If possible, try to cleanse the poison before healing yourself or allies, but I don't think your allies will appreciate your awareness of their toxic state if you decline to heal them on 10% hit points for maximum efficiency. 
You can use this dynamic to your advantage though. When you see a low enemy, be sure to help them out by giving them their medicine, so when they go for their heal, it's not quite what they're looking for. That kind of thinking is a general guide for all of the punishment conditions that we talked about. The key to using them is forcing your opponents to eat the punishment by giving them no other option. After all, they're not exactly going to deliberately feed, but then again, this is Guild Wars 2, so who knows. Before we get to the control conditions, vulnerability deserves a mention. Each stack of vulnerability causes targets to take 1% extra damage from all sources, stacking up to 25%. First of all, this is just essential for player versus environment. A straight up 25% free damage modifier is absolutely insane, and one of the most powerful effects you can have for fighting any monster. If you don't have the boss covered in the broken shield that manifests when applying vulnerability, then something is going horribly wrong. In competitive modes, it's very much as you would expect. You don't have infinite vulnerability application, so you want to apply it when you're going for a massive burst attack to crush an unsuspecting player. Even a few extra stacks can really make the difference. Every time you see a player get away with 3% health, just imagine what would have happened with a few vulnerability stacks. In reality, it's seldom that simple though. There's an opportunity cost for everything, and you can't just set up the ultimate combo with 25 vulnerability. An Often you'll be applying vulnerability incidentally, rather than deliberately stacking up vulnerability before unleashing a deadly attack. It's more like doing both at the same time, and the vulnerability enables even more damage from subsequent attacks or from your allies. Moving on to the really fun stuff, the control conditions. First up is Blind. Blind is a bit like Aegis, except the other way around. It causes you to miss your next attack, and then promptly removes itself. It's one of the few boons or conditions that has a very potent visual tell, because the edges of the screen will darken to indicate your compromised vision, in addition to the black smoke covering the character's eyes. Blind can be a very strong effect, because just like Aegis, it can completely mitigate any attack, no matter how powerful it is. So smart usage of this condition can really throw a spanner in the works for you or your enemies. If you get blinded, try to burn it with a weak attack. Blind can last for a good amount of time, so just minimize the loss and move on. Note that blind will only nullify the first hit in a multi-hit attack, but will cause an area attack to completely whiff, despite it potentially hitting multiple targets simultaneously. One of the most dreaded conditions is Chill. Chill reduces movement speed by a gargantuan 66%, and also increases cooldowns by 66%, turning your recharge numbers blue. Fortunately, Chill is often fairly short in duration, but when your character turns a frosty ice color, you are in some serious trouble. The slow is bad enough and will severely reduce your capacity to escape danger. The slower cooldown mean that you might not be able to get to your key abilities in time to save yourself. Needless to say, Chill is extremely potent, and a well-timed frigid burst can seal the fate of an opponent if they are not ready. This is particularly true if they're trying to run away or kite. A chilled foe will more or less be three times slower than you, which means there will be no escape, and even the simplest jumping puzzle will be impossible. Of course, this means you can also chill enemies so they can't catch up to you, which is very useful in player versus player. But also, in player versus environment, you can slow down monsters trying to eat you, or cause enemies to bunch up so they can all be cleaved down with ease. Chill is very scary. Avoid it or get rid of it as fast as you can. A step down from Chill is Cripple. Cripple simply reduces movement speed by 50%. As you can imagine, it has similar applications to Chill, but typically lasts a bit longer because it's a significantly weaker effect. Use Cripple to snare enemies so they're easier to lock down and hit, or shoot them in the legs so they can't chase you. Very straightforward. The epitome of movement impairing effects is Immobilize. As its name implies, Immobilizes causes chains to erupt from the ground and grab a hapless character's feet, preventing them from moving or dodging. That last fact is important too. Not being able to dodge can be a death sentence, and tactically using Immobilize to deny your foes from evading can be the key to securing a kill. 
Even disregarding that, losing the ability to move can be catastrophic on its own. As slow as cripple or chill make you, they are nothing compared to being truly immobilized. Immobilized can even be worse than a straight up stun sometimes, because it can't be broken out of with a stun break, and stability won't save you either. It can be cleansed of course, but if you're loaded up with many conditions, then it might take a while to break through to remove it. If you get immobilized, you'll want to be very careful with what you do next. If you can't cleanse the fiendish condition or use resistance, it's very likely that an attempt on your life is about to be made. Play accordingly defensive if you're trapped in a barrage of attacks, and try and use whatever you have to survive, like blocks or invulnerabilities. All abilities still work, just not your feet. Quite amusingly, attempting to use any skill that has a movement component will still work, but you just won't go anywhere. You can, however, use teleport or shadow step skills to move around while immobilized, but you'll still be stuck when arriving at your destination. When it comes to conditions, the only way is down, because fear and taunt are the next topic. They are fairly similar effects in that they both count as both a condition and a stun breakable effect, and remove control of the player character temporarily. Fear makes you run away from whoever feared you, note that this means whoever you're actually afraid of can steer you to an extent, and taunt does the opposite. You get very angry because your enemy insults your mother's honor, and you rush them mindlessly, using only basic auto attacks. An interesting feature of taunt is that although you'll move towards whoever taunts you, you'll stop moving when in range. This means that taunting a ranged enemy will often cause them to simply stand in place auto attacking you. Taunt and Fear both have significant visual tells. Fear appears as a spooked skull over terrified characters, and Taunt as some fierce looking cross swords with a red backdrop. The nature of these two effects leaves little to be explained really. Avoid them at all costs, and learn what abilities inflict them, because you don't have enough stun breaks to escape every time. The two key facts to take away here are that stability will prevent fear and taunt from being applied in exchange for a stack, and once again, both abilities marked as a stun break or condition removal will get rid of them, so always bear that in mind. Some extended applications of these two powerful conditions outside of just shutting down enemies include interrupting foes, as they both count as hard crowd control, and moving enemies. Taunt can lure foes away from allies, and fear can create space between you and your cowardly adversaries. The fun really never ends though. Slow may have a very cute turtle icon and a cool blue swirly effect, but it is as debilitating as quickness is amazing. While slowed, all actions carried out by the afflicted are 50% slower, which will be sure to absolutely crumple the damage output from those standing against you, while also rendering them significantly more vulnerable to interruption because of the slow skill activation times. If you are slow, you are are very sad. Suddenly your enemies are like a fly which you cannot swat because they're going to have an easy time dodging your slothful strikes. Nothing else to say except that slow is really really powerful, and time itself will appear to slow down while you wait for it to go away. Last but certainly not least is weakness, the condition counterpart to might and vigor. When designing weakness, the developers realized that they ran out of conditions, so they might as well do a two-for-one deal, and therefore made weakness an absolute monster of a debuff. While weakened, players will have a 50% slower endurance regeneration rate, so that's not exactly great right off the bat. But in addition to that, 50% of all attacks will be glancing blows. A glancing blow deals 50% of normal damage and cannot be a critical hit. Bear in mind, a critical hit will often deal 200% damage or even more, so that means weakness ends up reducing power damage output by up to just shy of 40%, and that is truly fearsome. The most deadly assault can be turned into a gentle tap by this humble sounding boon, that combined with the aforementioned endurance penalty can severely hamper both the offensive and defensive capabilities of any player, making weakness one of the most powerful conditions in the game, a fact many players overlook.
The one escape from weakness is that it does not affect condition damage, only power. So condition builds do get away with it a little bit, but a lot of the time condition builds, particularly in player versus player, also have a power damage component or interact with critical strikes in some way. So even they are not completely unscathed. Weakness is a truly formidable effect and is in some ways a very pure realization of what a condition is, something that makes your life harder no matter what. To really put the icing on the cake, Might, which is a very common boon and integral to a lot of professions damage output, gets corrupted into weakness. There is nothing quite like transforming a player roided out on 25 Might stacks into a total wet noodle. There is a little detail about control conditions related to battling bosses that is very important. Bosses are usually immune to control effects, including control conditions. This is to prevent players from simply denying them from ever being able to attack, but control conditions can still do a significant amount of damage to the break bar of bosses, which when fully depleted will often temporarily put the boss out of action for a while, so it is still worth applying these effects to the most powerful monsters when you see the fabled blue bar. That wraps up the effects for every boon and condition in the game, along with a few pointers. Boons and conditions shape the flow of combat, and managing them both and understanding how they limit and empower you and your opponents is key to emerging victorious. A few extra details will list in the sidebar during the overview of each effect, including the corruption and conversion for each boon. So be sure to go back if you're looking for the full details. You can also find a lot of information about this sort of thing on the wiki if you're curious. As always, feel free to ask anything in the comment section and check out the other videos in this series. I'm looking to create a complete guide to all the mechanics and systems in Guild Wars 2, so if you're new or just looking to build some big brain knowledge, then here is the place for it. I also stream a lot on Twitch, so after you're done following me on all social media, if you want to ask anything in detail or get directly involved in the community, that's where you want to be. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.